Some of you would recognize some names if I threw them out there like J.T. Pugh, T.F. Tenney, uh, James Kilgore, Billy Cole, T.W. Barnes. Those are elders of our movement that have affected, most of you have heard sermons by them or they've affected your life in one way or another. Elders that have gone on to their reward. Uh, But only a few of you will recognize these names, John Russell, Lamar Montesmith, Harold Hansen, Herschel Ferris, Bill Sapp. Those are elders from my childhood. Those are the guys and their wives who kept the church doors open and probably are responsible for me being here today. And so we want to pause and do a very biblical thing today and honor our elders. Uh, there, these elders that I mentioned served me well. In fact, my home church, there's probably a dozen preachers that came out of that little church. Uh, and two of them became superintendents. And the elders were not scholars. Some of them even had wobbles in their walk with God. But they came back and they dug in and they were faithful to God and they made a difference in the kingdom of God. And the scripture tells us we're supposed to honor our our elders. Our our world is ignoring this this principle. Those of you who are parents can see it very plainly. If your kids would just listen to you, you're not trying to get them to listen to you because you want to blab. You're trying to save them the problems that you experience, right? It's the same way when elders of the church speak into your life. They're really not trying to control you. Most elders, anyway, that I know of have enough problems of their own. If they're talking to you, they've gone out of their way to talk to you. If they've reached out to you, it's extra on their plate. It's it's a kind thing that they're doing. They're not trying to breathe down your neck. They're trying to share something that they earned the, the hard way. Or God is using them to speak into our lives. And we see in the Old Testament, Moses as a a model of a pastor, and his church was in in the the wilderness, all those people in the wilderness, were, were kind of a model of how God wants to bring us together in groups of people. God said, I want to call a people out of everybody else. I want a group of people who will follow me. And he gave them a leader, but he also instructed Moses to use elders. And I thought it was interesting when I began studying again around the giving of the Ten Commandments, because in my mind I'd forgotten some of the story. You know, a lot of times we just think in terms of they went out into the wilderness and they got to Mount Sinai, and Moses went up on the mountain and he got the Ten Commandments and he came down and he was mad and he broke them and then he went back and got another set of Ten Commandments. But if you go back and read all the stories, Moses made seven trips up Mount Sinai. And on the sixth or seventh trip, depending on how you interpret things, he actually took the elders with him part way. And this is what the scripture says in Exodus chapter 24. This is from the message paraphrase. Then they climbed the mountain, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who later messed up, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and saw the God of Israel. He was standing on a pavement of something like sapphires, pure, clear, sky blue. He didn't hurt these pillar leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. God said to Moses, climb higher up the mountain and wait there for me. I'll give you the tablets of stone, the teachings and commandments I've written to instruct them. God wanted a pastor And he wanted elders. He didn't want a one-man show. He didn't want a guy. He didn't want a personality leading his church. He wanted a bunch of people who could all see the cloud, who could all see and and test the spirit, who could all move together. The problem is, if you read the story of that church in the wilderness, it was a mess. And sometimes it didn't work too good. 
And there was even a church split where some of the elders wanted to go off and do their own thing. And there was a time when the assistant pastor, Aaron, messed up and he made the golden calf. And there was another time when his, his sister, Moses' sister, Miriam, spoke ill of him and she was uh, made leprous. And there was, there was all kinds of mess, just like there is in any church. There's two amens. You can be honest about that. We're human. But there's a, a stability when there's more than one voice, when there's elders who buy in, when there's people, other people besides just the preacher who buys in. And I want to give honor today to those of Acts 2 Ministries who have done that. And I'll say from the start, there are some people that we have called elders and we recognize as elders as in a position, but then there are others in this church who are elders who have lived the life, who have been a strength, who have kept the doors open, who other people look to. You being here sometimes helps somebody else who comes and shows up to, to live their life because it's like that, that person's always there. I can always count on that person to be there. Some, you can do that. You can be so faithful that you never miss. You may be seated. So I want to begin by reading something that I've read. I think this may be the fourth time I've read it. About 22 years ago or so, I read a book, and it's by Larry Crabb. It's called The Silence of Adam. And the point of the book was when Adam and Eve were in the garden, the very first sin that was committed was when Eve took of the fruit. And if you read that carefully, you can draw the conclusion pretty safely that Adam was probably right there when Eve took of the fruit. But Adam didn't say anything. Adam forfeited his leadership, which men can often do, because leadership's a scary thing. It's a, it's a big responsibility. It's hard to lead. It's, it's really easier to please than it is to lead. So Adam was silent and his family suffered for it. And so this man, Larry Crabb, makes the case. If we could get elders, men and women, who would take their place and who would speak into the world, whether people are listening or not. Mothers, teach your kids to say thank you whether they listen to you or not. Teach them about God whether they stick with it or not. Be faithful to God even if your kids are not faithful to God. We need elders who are rock solid because a lot of times kids wander off and then they realize, wow, I was wrong. And if you're still there, they have somebody to come back and, 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 and get direction from. And so I'm going to read a couple of pages here from him. He says, I have a dream. Only time will tell if it's truly from God. I think it is. My dream is really quite simple. As I look 30 years into the future, I see a few groups scattered here and there across the Christian landscape where godly character and spiritual wisdom are more honored than degrees and skill and more valued than achievement or expertise. I see a community of struggling people plagued with all the ills that come from living in a world where we're never designed to endure, battling against inclinations and urges we were never intended to feel. I see people whose marriages are awful, whose children have shattered their hope for a happy family, whose emotions are out of control, who spend horribly long nights terrified by childhood memories and unspeakable abuse, who feel so hurt by rejection that it seems their hearts are being torn right out of their chests, who hate themselves because of the sexually perverted urges that rage within them, who come close to giving up all hope under the weight of never-ending loneliness. In my dream, I see these people doing something that very few are doing today in real life. I see them walking past the office that had a shingle advertising a professional whose training guarantees technical competence, but not a godly character. I see them returning to books, the books to the shelf and the Christian bookstores, the books that have the jackets that falsely promise now that 
falsely promise now what only heaven will later provide. I see them picking up a flyer, promoting the seminar everyone's talking about, looking at it and putting it down. I see these people stumbling into the living room of the lonely widow, making their way to the coffee shop to spend a couple of hours with the tired widower, knocking on the door of the study where someone waits who is clothed with humility and eager for heaven, someone who is unselfconsciously faithful as he warmly points to Christ. I envision a generation in which mentors are not in such short supply, in which pastors and elders are once again held in high esteem because they pastor an elder, in which Christian leaders are no longer asked to manage ministries in the way executives build corporations, but rather are revered as men of godly influence. If I look hard into my dream, I could see an army of wise men and women distributed among God's people, armed with only gentle discernment and penetrating wisdom, character qualities that have been forged in the fires of suffering. These are the ones who have paid a price few are willing to pay, and they have paid it continually for years without relief. These men are fathers. These women are mothers, godly people whose quiet presence is felt and valued. A young couple wrote me in desperation, we've been married six years and it's just not working. Do you know a good Christian therapist in our area? Why would this couple write to me, a trained, licensed professional psychologist, rather than an elder in their church to meet with them? Were they drawn to my title, by my character? Why do most people with problems think immediately of getting professional help? Why don't they turn to wise Christian men and women? Most of us would, do, would, would no more consult an elder in our church for the help with panic attacks or sexual struggles than we would ask the pastor to perform a root canal. Why? Our culture has bought the lie that personal problems are no different in nature than physical problems. In both kinds of problems, we, we think something's wrong that can only be fixed by an expert whose understanding exceeds the wisdom provided in the Bible. We have entirely lost sight of the fact that every non-physical problem is, at core, a moral problem with its roots in the person's relationship with God. We've therefore produced a generation of therapists, an army of counselors, trained to do battle with problems they poorly understand because they've spent more time in classrooms becoming experts than in God's presence becoming elders. We have lost interest in developing mentors, wise men and women who knew how to get to the real core of things and who have the power to bring supernatural resources to bear on what's wrong. In my dream, if it continues, our entire culture will shift like an earthquake that dramatically changes the landscape, so my dream, if realized, will profoundly alter our most cherished institutions. It will shatter our most deeply entrenched assumptions about how we should live our lives. Everything non-material will change. Things that have their basis in scientific facts and empirically tested procedures will not, of course, be affected. Techniques for doing surgery and engineering plans for building skyscrapers will not be changed by the revolution I envision, nor will the legitimate use of medication for panic attacks, obsessive compulsive disorders, in some cases depression, be changed. But how we do church, how we influence lives, how we provide social and moral leadership, how we live together in families and in communities will radically be altered. Celebrities will become obscure. A few sentences from an elder will mean more than the secrets of effective living that are shared by an acclaimed communicator at a weekend seminar. Big Christian events will be limited to evangelism or meaningful prayer, passionate worship, or biblical instruction. People will covet an evening in a mentor's home more than the chance to attend a motivational rally. They will know that the former has more life-changing power than the latter. Award banquets in the Christian community will feel less like Hollywood events. People will be honored in a way that meaningfully humbles them rather than holds them up as more significant because of their achievements. No one will compete for top honors with Christ. I shared that 20-some years ago, and we appointed elders, and we tried to make Acts 2 a church where elders are an important part. And 
I've slowly, as you, most of you who've been here have seen, we've slowly given the elders more and more responsibility and more and more authority. And uh, I feel like they've, they've come to full fruition in the last couple of years. The first couple, Adam and Eve, taught us that we need to care more about what God thinks than what family thinks. And I've watched each one of these elders have to face that in their own family. I've watched them be faithful when their own kids think that they're crazy for hanging on to their faith. That's what's going to make a church strong. That's what makes Acts 2 Ministries what it is. I feel blessed. I feel like we have better elders than Moses had. Now, we're not three million people, and that's, you know, if we had that many, there'd be a lot more bad apples in the bunch, I'm sure. But I feel blessed. And as, I've, as we've launched other churches, for example, uh, I, I'm now, you know, serving as a mentor to at least four or five other pastors. Two of them were church starts from Acts 2 Ministries. And what all of those guys who are starting new churches are saying to me without, without any exception is, I wish we had some elders. I wish there were some people that I can count on to be there every single Sunday. I wish there was somebody else who would show up when I call the prayer meeting. But they don't, there's too few people who will be elders nowadays. Our, our culture doesn't honor elders. And so people don't think it's that big of a deal to be an elder. And, and they don't realize how their fortitude and their strength can be a shadow for those around them. They, they, they can be an anchor. Now, God is always the anchor. You know, we always hold to Him. But actually, prayer and coming together on Sunday would just disappear completely if it weren't for some folks who had a conviction to make that happen. Uh, and, and, and just think of this logically speaking. Um, people are wondering, do I need to spend time with God? Or how important it is, is it for me to come together with God's people? Um, think about your life as if it were a pizza. Um, now, if your uh, life... Or, or just even think about coming together to my house for a pizza party. If we had one big pizza, and I cut that pizza, started cutting that pizza, said, I'm going to give everybody a piece. And I just kept cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And finally, there were 17 pieces of pizza. Would it be a very big slice? No. Seven, one seventeenth isn't very much. You'd go home and you'd have to eat snacks. And, and so if I took your week and I cut it up in 17 pieces, one seventeenth of your week is not very much. And I figured it out that if you, if you were faithful to Sunday morning, if you came back to class, if you attended a leadership course, and then you attended your prayer and care group, and you traveled 45 minutes one way to all of those things, it would still only be one-sixteenth of your week. And yet, in our culture, it's hard for people who say they're going to heaven to even carve out one-seventeenth of their week for the body of Christ at large. Now, you can have your own relationship with God, but what about the rest of the world? When was the last time your own relationship touched the rest of the world? How much more have you seen get done when the body of Christ comes together? How many times have you seen people come in here and their lives be changed, whereas if you hadn't come, if we hadn't come together, their life wouldn't be changed? Somebody's got to care about that. Somebody's got to buy into that. Somebody's got to be an elder. Someone's got to stand for that. And, and I understand I can have a relationship with God personally to some extent, without church. And, and I'm not trying to say church is everything. You can come to church and not know Jesus. You can, be, you can be religious and not have a relationship with God. 
So we need relationship with God. That has to be the basis of everything. But if, if you have a relationship with God, but you don't come together, then other people can't benefit. If you don't open your living room and let people come pray, your neighbors never get touched. I, I can uh, brush my teeth, but I can't give myself a root canal. And there are some things that don't happen unless you have the body of Christ. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, what? So for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, that's God's design. God said, I want you to have a personal relationship with me, but then I want you to buy into this thing. I want you to buy in like I wanted the elders to buy in. If the elders would have bought in, they wouldn't have spent 40 years in the wilderness. So elders have a very, very important part in the kingdom of God. I know elders, like I just said, the the elders of Acts 2 Ministries, I've seen them many times when there was a birthday party in their family, they would just tell their family, I'll be there when I'm done with church. And someone might say, well, don't offend your family. The silence of Adam. Who's first? Does the tail wag the dog? We need elders who put God first. Uh, Elders, I'll tell you this. I've I've been pastor for 25 years, and I so appreciate the cards, and I appreciate people uh, at the door who say, thank you, that touched my life, and all that. And all of that is meaningful, and I, I know people mean it from their heart when they give us uh, words of encouragement when there's a pastoral appreciation Sunday and there's gifts and uh, that's good. I love it. I, I accept that. I appreciate it. But nothing encourages me as much as 930 when I'm here beginning to plow my way into the service, believing God to change lives. And I look out there and there's somebody else who believes God's going to be here today. There's somebody else who's willing to pay a price for the service. There's an elder who come. And if you don't think that our pre-service prayer is important, uh, you haven't talked to that many people. Uh, For example, just just recently, uh, uh, we were talking with Paula Raymond, who's new to Acts 2 Ministries, and she mentioned that the first thing that struck her is when she came into the church, we were all in a spirit of prayer, and how much that meant to her that there was a presence of God here. We weren't here for one another. We were here to connect with God. The Pharisees last week who go all over the world complimented on us us on our pre-service prayer and said, that is so neat what you do. So many churches, people are just talking to each other. There's all kinds of activity and then you just try to get into ministry and it doesn't happen. What is that? That's elders, not just the people we call elders, but that's people who bought in, who, who, who understand that we're here. It's a spiritual thing and we're connecting with God who care about that. It's not just a preacher who cares about Building a ministry. It's a bunch of people who believe in God and they believe in the community and they say we're going to come together and every week we're going to touch God and some weeks we're going to have to pray through a few things. Some weeks there's going to be distractions. This week the, the band battery was dead and two or three families are out of pocket because they're sick and, and so there's always enough to throw things out of kilter. Sometimes the, the sound system gets devils in it and sometimes there's all kinds of confusion here or there and, and, and we have to decide as elders, as people who want a move of God, not just as one guy who's going to give a speech in a few minutes, but a bunch of people who say, I want God to be here today. I want something to happen in this place today. Elders, they influence us. They love us, and I appreciate them. I'm going to ask Brian to come say a few words about that. Hallelujah. Well, I was thinking recently about elders and just how much of an impact they've made, you know, even not even in just in our life, but in our, our movement. Um, he mentioned some of them, G.A. Mang and T.W. Barnes, and the list just keeps going on and on. How many times have you listened to a sermon that really impacted you or helped you or increased your faith? How many times have you heard something that just, it was almost like a key, like you were just praying and praying and praying or reading the scripture and then he was preaching the word of God and he just said the right thing or the right phrase and it just, it clicked. It clicked with you. And I don't know about you, but I've been just so blessed with elders in my life. Um, First and foremost is God, relationship with God, prayer, reading the word and whatnot. 
But the fellowship helps, and the elders make a difference. I know for me personally, I was brought into Acts 2 Ministries by an elder. I know for me personally, when I was brought in, other elders helped, helped me be, set up a foundation and taught me scriptures and words. I know for me, other, and another elder has taught me like revelation and how to dig deeper and how to really study the word. And for me personally, I've just been, uh, been so affected by elders and their influence. And even if I've never spoken to one specifically, I know they're praying for me. I know they're reaching out in, to God on my behalf. I know they're interceding or doing different things for me. And I, I was just thinking recently about elders and how much of an impact they make and how they really help. And, and it's almost like if you read the word, there were people that were Jews. Jews were set aside. You, you had um, the Gentiles or the people just in the world doing whatever. Then you had Jews, which are God people. But then you had that other level. Uh, I believe it was called a Nazarene, a Nazarite. And they went one step further and they sacrificed a little further. They made promises that normal Jews didn't make. They did things a little further, a little deeper, a little uh, more specific. Samson was one of them. Samuel was one of them. And they were all used by God. And when I think of elders, I think of that because they go a little further, like Bishop was saying. They do a little more, and even when you don't know anything about it, they may be at the church cleaning or fixing something or, or doing something else. You may, you may be having a hard time and just wake up one day happy or maybe joyful or just something going on, but you didn't know that that elder was praying for you. You didn't know they were making a difference. I remember one story that um, was told that there was a person that was working with this elder, and they, the elder was talking to that person and witnessing and, and whatnot. And in the middle of the night, they just woke up and they knew this elder was praying for them. They knew that this person was, was, was just going to God on their behalf. So then the next day, this person went into work and said, hey, were you praying for me at such and such a time? I certainly was. He said, I knew it. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was just straight up and I knew so-and-so was praying for me. And that's the impact that the elders have, the authority that the elders have. They help, they, they increase, they help push forward. It's almost like Joshua where Moses was doing the work, but then Joshua, the elder that was underneath Moses, came and started pushing things forward and started taking land. It's not that it was Joshua specifically, but the, the, the position and the role that they have in our life, in the community, in the, the church, makes an impact. When I look at this, I think of these pillars. And if you remove these pillars, this would fall. It's not that you couldn't put something else underneath it, but there's some kind of strength or there's something holding this up. And when I think of pillars, I think of the elders. I think a lot of the time people do help, but the pillars are really there. They're, they're tried and true. They wake up in the morning and they go at the time they're supposed to be there. They do what they're supposed to do. They pray when they're supposed to be praying and they pray when they're not supposed to be praying. Even in the middle of the night, they get up. Sometimes they're up longer than you've been sleeping. You know, you know and just they, they, they do so much that it's just unseen. They do so much that we, we're not aware of. But the spirit realm knows about it. But the angels hear the prayers and the Lord knows and being an elder isn't just age. It's, it's almost like a calling. It's almost like an anointing. It's almost like uh, a position that God makes and ordains somebody for. It's not just an age that when you get up to 70, you finally you're going to be an elder of a church. But it's, a, it's, it's some kind of spiritual authority, position, place, thing that God ordains. And so even if, if it looks like they're not doing much, even if it looks like there's nothing really going on with that elder. The spirit realm knows. The spirit realm hears. The spirit realm reacts more specifically because everything first starts on the spirit and then manifests on the physical. And the spirit moves on the behalf of elders, I believe, maybe not in such a, a greater way, but in a, in a special way. Just because if you're truly an elder, you put the time of prayer. You put the time in the Word. You put the time with God, even relationship with God, even that time spending with God. They, even if you don't know who that elder is, the elder may be known by God more than any other great name preacher. A lot of the times, we're looking for somebody with 100 degrees and a nice tie, but God is looking for that commitment, that consecration, that time where they're just going to maybe even give up everything for Jesus. And so I, I, 
I honor the elders. I'm thankful for the elders. Uh, I'm so thankful. And again, I know I said it at the anniversary uh, video, but I think we have the best elders in Acts 2 Ministries. So can we just all stand and give them a standing ovation for all the elders that are in this church, just for how grateful we are and the commitments that they make. So let me just explain how we try to do this biblically speaking. Um, this is on our website, and this is on the job description of our elders. Elders played an important role in the life of the church through their ministry to the sick. They were apparently the teachers also in the local congregation. And in addition to ministering to the sick, their duties consisted of explaining the scriptures and teaching doctrine. That's from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. The, the uh, Unger's Bible Dictionary says, The elders of the New Testament church were the pastors, overseers, the leaders who have charge of the flock. They're also the regular teachers of the congregations, congregation whose duty it was to expound the scriptures and administer the sacraments. This is what the scripture says in 1 Peter, and this is from the Living Bible. And now a word to you elders of the church. I too am an elder. With my own eyes I saw Christ dying on the cross, and I too will share his glory and his honor when he returns. Fellow elders, this is my plea to you. Feed the flock of God. Care for it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you get out of it, but because you are eager to serve the Lord. Don't be tyrants, but lead them by your good example. And when the head shepherd comes, your reward will be a never-ending share in his glory and honor. You younger men, follow the leadership of those who are older, and all of you serve each other with humble spirits. For God gives special blessings to those who are humble, but sets himself against those who are proud. If you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, in his good time, he will lift you up. Let him have all your worries and cares, for he's always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion looking for some victim to tear apart. Stand firm when he attacks. Trust the Lord. Remember that other Christians all around the world are going through these sufferings too. And after you've suffered a little while, our God, who is full of kindness through Christ, will give you his eternal glory he personally will come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. To him be all power over all things forever and ever. Amen. That's the biblical basis. That's what I ask of the elders of Acts 2 Ministries. And uh, sometimes people think in terms of, wow, how come they're always getting to do everything? Uh, it's probably because they're an elder. But it's really just the opposite. They're an elder because they're here for everything. They're probably involved in everything because they'll say yes to anything. And I know you have to draw boundaries. I'm not trying to get everybody to make this a cult where I can just tell you everything to do. I'm just saying there are people who buy in. And without that, you don't have a good, strong church. And I want to thank our leaders, our elders for buying in. If you're not familiar, or even if you are, let me just review our flow chart here at Acts 2 Ministries. Uh, Jesus Christ is the head, and I'm following Jesus Christ just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The United Pentecostal Church that I'm licensed with, our district that I'm submitted to, and my pastor and other men that I'm submitted to speak into my life, and they hold me accountable. Our church board which we elect every year, and the elder board, which is the, the people we're honoring today, they speak into my life, and I hold myself accountable to them, and all of those guys are helping me stay where I need to be under Christ. Under me are the weekly services. I, I, I'm, I get people to help me do the weekly services, including the musicians, the cleaning, the media, the ushers, all of that is over here, and when guest speakers come, and the fivefold ministry that I just mentioned, uh, they, they submit to my leadership because I'm leading this local congregation, so they submit to that when they come minister here. Under me are elders, and those elders are helping me oversee our prayer groups and our classes, and when we have them congregations, other congregations or daughter works, so the elders are under me, and under the elders are other people. It's, it's a, a system of operation 
where it's not a one-man show. It's, uh, I serve as the coordinator, but under me, I, I pour myself into elders. I spend more time with the elders than I do other people. Then they spend time with the people that they're overseeing. And, and then when it comes down to everyone in the church, everyone is taken care of. Here's another uh, flow chart that describes it even more specifically. Uh, Starting again with me overseeing the elders. The, the, the six elders of our congregation, our brother and sister Terry and Dorothy Hart, David and Debbie Ford, Nathaniel and Donise Hart, Seth and Melanie Stevanovich, Dennis and Susan Bisquette, and Tim and Michelle Tremblay. They are elders. I've asked each one of these to take, a, take oversight of a certain group or certain groups in the church. So uh, I'll explain this because it's... it's a, uh, not quite finalized and, and that we're believing God to give us just a few more leaders so we can uh, be com- completely, uh, we can have a complete tree here. But right now, uh, brother and sister Hart are, uh, they are founding pastors of Acts 2 Ministries. And uh, I think everybody here knows who they are. They, their lives have been touched, but there's, uh, they're, they're national treasure. There are, uh, we, we love them. And, and they're elders in the sense that they founded the church, but then they went away and founded another church. And when they came back, we asked them to serve as honorary elders. But not only are they honorary elders, but they lead the ambassador's prayer group. So uh, at, at 84, uh, most people would say, I'm not going to do anything anymore. But they represent that spirit of an elder. And they're, they're still influencing. They're still giving people rise to church. They're still loving people because that's who they are. And if, if it weren't for them, most of us wouldn't be here worshiping today because somebody was an elder. Uh, Brother and Sister Ford oversee the prayer group that Brother and Sister Hart are actually leading, but they're, they're kind of serving side by side as well. Then Brother and Sister Ford also oversee the prayer group that the Savories and uh, David and Latrice Ford families have just recently formed. We've had some people move, and so we've realigned a few prayer groups, and they're starting a new prayer group in Thompson, and uh, it's under the Fords. Under Brother and Sister uh, Hart, Nathaniel and Donnie's Hart, is uh, the, the Simpsons who do the Life Light prayer group, and the Dyers are in Springfield right now. They're not meeting, but the, that's still a, a placeholder, and they're still uh, overseeing them as a couple, and uh, Sister Dyer's doing some Bible studies. Uh, but the Stevanoviches are also under Brother and Sister Hart, but they're also elders because we've asked them to start a uh, preaching point at Yukon in stores. So they're doing the same thing the hearts are. They're, they're under somebody, but they're also kind of serving as elders. And uh, so it's kind of hybrid happening there. And then Dennis and Susan Bisquet are leading the prayer group that the Bales and the Blaisdells lead. Right now they've merged their groups, Refuge and Refreshing. Eventually we're hoping to split those up again. And then Serenity Prayer Group is the one in Plainfield that they, they actually lead. And then Tim and Michelle Tremblay oversee Bob Tremblay's prayer group called The Lighthouse, the Zonia's prayer group called Genesis, which reached in Southbridge, and Oasis, which they lead as well. So right now, some of our elders are still not only overseeing, but they're also leading a prayer group. Uh, Ideally, what we're believing God for is where our elders do nothing but oversee. All they do is go help their prayer groups, but we need more people to lead those prayer groups. And when we get them in place, we'll have a, a full chart there. But not only do they do this, but I've asked each one of these elders to do something. They they each have kind of an expertise. For example, Nathaniel and Donise Hart not only supervise those groups, but uh, she is administrative secretary. And I've asked Brother Hart to help me administrate training institute classes. So he does all the scheduling of that and contacting people, making that happen. Uh, Brother and sister Tim Tremblay oversee those groups, but also uh, they, they help us with children's ministry still once a week. They go minister in there. Uh, also, when there's things like painting, things like that, he, since that's his expertise, he helps in, in areas like that. The Fords uh, 
I've asked Brother Ford to lead special prayer meetings and uh, usually mechanical issues that happen around here. He takes care of that. Plowing, very practical things on that order. Brother Busquets also helped with uh, other areas of, uh, of the building, but then Brother and Sister Busquet have led our Life and Focus group or our Empower New England group, or we've used different names, but the special meetings that we have for people who are dealing with depression or uh, anger management or any kind of chemical abuse. So each of these elders, uh, each of those four elders have several hats that they still wear. That's how it works here. They, they represent me, <clears throat> and they're a great help to me. And <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when they call on you, it's like me calling on you. Sometimes <clears throat> uh, they, they spot a need in your life and they let me know about it because I wouldn't know about it if they didn't say something to me about that. This is how it works. If you're sick, your prayer group leader is supposed to be the one to, to notice you didn't show up to prayer group and find out what's wrong with you and then maybe come pray for you. But if you end up in the hospital or something like that, they'll make sure and let their elder know, hey, someone's in the hospital. And the elder may go, like the Bible says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church and they'll anoint with oil and pray for you. So the elder may come to the hospital and pray for you. Now, I might come too, but don't wait for me to come because the whole body is ministering. A deacon can pray and you be healed. An elder can pray and you be healed. And, and we're all caring for one another that way. It's not just the preacher caring for everybody who comes to his church. It's the body of Christ, and it's, it's healthy that way. So I'd like us to take a few minutes before we leave today and thank our elders. So I've asked the ushers, if they would, to pass out a small card. I've actually asked them to give each of you two cards. If you need a pen, they'll also have a pen that they're passing out. So as they begin to move through the congregation, make sure to get two cards. And if you need a pen, let them know that you want a pen. And I'm going to give you instructions on this as they begin to pass those out. Uh, I'd like for you, if you, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with more than one elder. Uh, but to the best of your ability, I'd like for you to choose two of these elders and I'd like for you to write them a thank you note. In a few minutes, uh, there's some baskets that we've made to show our appreciation for these elders. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to come drop your cards in this, these baskets and then they're going to be able to go home and read your thank yous. So while I'm talking and while we're, <clears throat> my wife's going to come say something, um, and while they're singing, you're going to be able to write your thank you. So I'd like for the praise team to come back to the platform. Some of you may have noticed that our praise team today was made up of all elders. I don't mean old people. I mean people who carry elder position. As we've grown and as we've added to the structure of Acts 2 Ministries, we've tried to relieve the elders. Uh, the, these people have done everything. They've done the cleaning. They taught Sunday school. They've, they've done uh, everything. So they've done everything we've asked. And at sometimes some of these people were teaching a Sunday school class, leading a prayer group, singing in the praise team, cleaning the church, you know, doing four or five things. And we've tried to, throughout the years, get other people to buy in and take responsibility for things in the church. And whenever we could, we've tried to get their lives to be more eldering and instead of all those other things. So in one last push for this, I've given the elders more and more responsibility. I've asked some of them to help with counseling. I've, help, I've asked them to oversee these prayer groups. And um, we're, we're now um, wanting to thank them today for their service on the praise team. And um, going forward, it's, except for special services, 
they will no longer be singing on the praise team, not because we don't like them and not because we don't need them. We're actually going to be hurting for a while, but because uh, we, we want them to have the, the freedom just to elder and not to have to uh, also come to extra practices and things like that. So first of all, would you join me in thanking these people for serving as the praise team for so many years? direction. You might want to reconsider that. You, you might want to turn off here. So I thank God for elders in my life. I thank God for the elders of Acts 2 Ministries. They truly have been the pillars that have held up the hands. Amen. Amen. So they're going to sing and worship in this song while you write your thank yous. And when, uh, when we're done, we're going to pray for the elders, and that's when you can bring your thank yous to the front. So if you can at least write one thank you to the elder that you are, are being overseen by, and then maybe choose another elder, and just express to them, you can use both sides of the cards if you need to, express to them your feelings about them. We're going to sing this song while you're doing that. God for your faithfulness. Thank you Jesus for your body. Thank you for the work that you're doing and the work through them. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? I'd like the elders if they would to come. Uh, Brother and Sister Hart can just remain seated. She's still having some hip issues. We we're praying for healing there. Um, the rest of you elders, if you would come find your basket, uh, I'd like for you to I'm going to put Brother and Sister Hart's basket in the chair, in the seat in front of him. And if each of you elders would find your basket and spread yourself out, set your basket next to you while you're standing up by the platform here. In just a minute, I'm going to ask all of you to come help me pray for these elders. And when you come, you can put your card in their basket. So to set your basket down and kind of stand to the side of it. And people are going to pray for you first. And they're going to also put the card in the basket. And if when we're all done here with this altar time, if you'd like to verbally say something to these elders, maybe you wrote two and you want to... You wish you had five cards? Uh, we're going to give you a chance to do that. My wife is going to sing after we prayed. But uh, elders, if you just spread out, we're going to have people come pray for you. So if we can go just a little bit more spread out. I wonder if you would now come, and uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily the elder that oversees you, but if, if we would have a few people by each elder couple to come pray I'd like us to pray for them right now. If you just come gather around them, a few of you over around the hearts, the rest of you around, come stand in front of one of these elders. If, if, if everyone would come participate, that would help. Just come find somebody that you're going to help pray for today. Just put your hands on them their shoulder on their head it doesn't matter let's just pray that God would bless our elders and make them strong God I pray for these men and these women pray God that you would give them fresh anointing today fresh strength thank you Lord for their touching our lives Jesus thank you for their ministry in our lives Jesus thank you Lord for fresh perspective I 
pray for fresh anointing, Lord. You would flow through them to the congregation. You would do a work through them, Lord. You would have your way in the efforts that you've asked them to put themselves into in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, for strength, their body, soul, and spirit, Lord, in every aspect of their lives, Jesus. Give them fresh strength and anointing, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for love. Let your grace flow into them and out through their ministries, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for strength. Thank you, Jesus, for fresh wind beneath their wings. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your physical strength. I pray, Lord, that you allow their influence to continue in Jesus' name and continue to flow through them as they make themselves of Him. Give them the physical strength, Lord, to be the influence that you've called them to be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to say one thing in closing. Uh, I, I touched on it earlier, but we've recognized these and given them responsibilities specifically to be elders of Acts 2 Ministries, but you are an elder because of who you are. Uh, if you don't carry the title, you can still have the influence. And uh, so there are people, like I said, in this congregation who we are giving honor to that don't carry the title, Elder, because that's who you are. You've been faithful. You're influencing other people. And, and I want to thank you for that. So God bless you. Have a great day. Minister to one another.